Beloved, grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as father and mother and Jesus Christ who alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning redeemer. Before we open our Bibles and get into the word of God on this day, I want to begin with a few thank yous. First of all, let me pause and thank Reverend Siobhan Arline Bradley for an amazing word of God that she blessed us with on last weekend. Siobhan is somebody's preacher. And I was blessed by that word, as I know you were as well. Let me also pause and thank all of you all for your prayers around my healing of my shoulder. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the prayers of the righteous are powerful. Through your prayers, my shoulder's getting better. I'm back in physical therapy. And we'll find out in just a few days whether or not surgery is really needed or not. So I do solicit your prayers as I thank you for them as well. And then finally, this upcoming Thursday is Veterans Day. We pause and acknowledge that our freedoms are not free. That there are men and women who've placed themselves in harm's way, have surrendered their lives, and sacrificed family to protect our freedoms and our liberties. On behalf of a generation like me that has never been forced into military service, we honor all of our military service women and men. We thank you, your spouses, and your families for the sacrifices you make for the freedoms that too often we take for granted. Thank you for how you serve. Let's open with a word of prayer and then we get into what I believe God would speak into our hearts on this weekend. God of grace and mercy, we thank you for the gift of worship. Two years ago, we never would have thought that we could be connected virtually and still feel the moving of the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for how you've kept us, how you've blessed us, how you've spoken to us. I pray now, O oh God, that you would do the same even now, that through the frailty of this flesh, your word may be clear and the name of Jesus may be glorified. Bless the reading, the preaching, the hearing, and the living of your holy word. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. I was in an interview a little while ago and they asked me what one of my favorite hobbies was, and I shared with them that I really enjoy movies. One of the things I lament most about COVID is the ability to every Monday go sit in a movie theater and watch the new film that debuts. The interviewer asked me, where did I get my love of movies from? And the answer is really simple. I got it from my father. My father loved movies. Wait, let me pause. My father loved movies where the lead character and the cast look like us. And because of that, I was raised to like and love black films. I love black films. I love seeing folk on screen that look like us. Matter of fact, I like it so much that I forced my sons to watch the same movies that I've enjoyed. Because I've made a decision that even if they won't teach correct racial history in the schools, I'm gonna make sure my sons are culturally and ethnically indoctrinated at home. And because I love black film and because they've got to watch it, they've seen all the movies I like. They've seen that great trio of movies starring Bill Cosby and Sidney Poitier, Uptown Saturday Night, Let's Do It Again, and Piece of the Action. They know every 40 acres and a mule film. School Days, Do the Right Thing, Mo Betta, and even Malcolm X. They are familiar with the two funniest movies ever made in the history of film, Coming to America and Friday. They've seen movies about African Americans and their service to the country in glory and soldier story. I've made them watch movies about our musical creativity, Tap, Five Heartbeats, Purple Rain, Dream Girls, and The Wiz. And the movie they've had to watch the most is hands down, arguably, one of my favorite movies of all time, The Color Purple. I can watch that 1985 cinematic rendition of Alice Walker's Pulitzer Prize winning novel time and time and time again. And since I know you have seen it, you know there's no doubt as to why that movie received 11 Academy Award nominations. 
It is a phenomenal story, a story of Miss Seeley, played by Whoopi Goldberg, of Mr. played by Danny Glover, of Miss Sophia, played by Oprah Winfrey, of Suge, played by Margaret I. Avery, Anne Harpo, played by Willard Pugh. The musical score was composed by Quincy Jones, and it's a phenomenal story of African Americans overcoming race, sexism, poverty, domestic violence, and incest through the tremendous power of faith and friendship. I'm gonna go home and watch it right after this sermon, as a matter of fact, because one of my favorite scenes in that movie is towards the very end. You remember it, it was a Sunday morning. Suge was back home. Suge was singing at a juke joint down the road from the church where her father pastored. And while he was preaching, someone stood up and said, y'all sing, God's trying to tell you something. And they began to sing that in the choir loft and Suge heard it in the juke joint and began to sing with them and walked her way into the sanctuary. All the while singing, can't sleep at night. And you wonder why. Maybe God is trying to tell you something. Maybe God is trying to tell you something. Maybe God is trying to tell you something. Beloved, I came by to tell you today that that's just not a scene in a movie. That's the reality of our lives. That there are multiple moments when God seeks to speak into the heart of his children and tell them something they need to know God is trying to tell us something. Beloved, there are three realities I want to drop in you that I believe are at work in the life of every believer. Number one is that God cares about everything that involves and affects you. God loves you and God cares about everything you're going through, every decision you have to make, every situation you're navigating through, the smallest decisions of your life, God cares about. There's never a moment when you can go to God and God's answer to you is, I don't care. God is never apathetic about anything in your life. God cares about everything that involves or affects you. And number two, not only does God care, but God has a will for everything everything you go through in life. And one of God's deepest desires for you is to discern his will and to obey it. And because God cares and because God has a will, God is always speaking to us. God is always broadcasting his will. God never plays hide and go seek with his will. God is never passive aggressive with his will. God never stutters or mumbles his words when he's trying to speak to us. God always wants to speak so that we know and obey his will over everything that affects us. Reality number one, God cares. Reality number two, God is speaking. Reality number three is that in our human flesh, we sometimes struggle to hear God clearly. Listen, I know somebody out there may be shaking your head. No, because your Bible is big. You speak in tongues. You go to worship every weekend. But allow me to tell the truth on behalf of the rest of us. There have been some moments when I have struggled to discern what God's will is. Because the truth be told, God may always be speaking, but we ain't always listening. We're not always attuned and attentive to what God is broadcasting about the things that affect our lives. This God who cares, this God who speaks, and we who struggle, that shows up in Scripture time and time again, especially in those rare moments when God speaks to somebody by calling their name twice. 
Beloved, let me teach Bible real quick. There are seven places in Scripture where God calls out to us by calling our name twice. And in each instance, I suggest to you that God is trying to tell us something. And so for these few Sundays and Saturdays that we have together in November, I want to take some time to examine and explore a few places where God calls someone by using their name twice. God does it with Abraham. God does it with Jacob. God does it with Samuel. God does it with Simon. God does it with Paul. God does it with Moses. But today I want to start with a name that's called twice in a passage that's familiar to us. We've been here before. It ministers to me every time I turn here. Luke chapter 10. Won't you return to the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Luke? And let's listen afresh to what God may be speaking on this day. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse number 38. You'll hear some words that are familiar to us as a family of faith. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse number 38, reads, As Jesus and his disciples are on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will be not be taken away from her. Martha, Martha. As you look at this first instance where the Lord calls someone by their name twice, I want to put a tag on this sermon and preach from the title, Can You Hear Me Now? Can you hear me now? Beloved, many of us are familiar with what goes down in Luke chapter 10. Jesus and his disciples have entered a city outside of Jerusalem called Bethany. And it is there that they are invited into a home they've been in before, a home owned by Martha. Martha has two folk living with her, her sister Mary and her brother Lazarus. You remember Mary. Mary was the one that took that oil and broke it open on the feet of Jesus and washed and wiped his feet with her hair. And you remember Lazarus. Lazarus didn't do nothing but die, but Jesus brought him back from the dead. So Jesus has now been invited into the home of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. And I want you to understand that in the day and time in which Jesus lived, hospitality was serious business. One of the things the Jews took very seriously was how you entertain strangers and how you open your door to guests, how you treated those who were weary. Because a failure to treat your guests correctly could lead to communal embarrassment. So Mary knows that Jesus is here. Martha knows Jesus is here. Lazarus knows Jesus is here. And we've got to host him and his disciples correctly. So Martha, knowing that the family name is on the line, gets busy doing everything that needs to be done. Floors need to be swept. Carpets need to be vacuumed. Dishes need to be washed. Bathrooms need to be Lysoled. Food needs to be prepared. Martha is taking care of everything that needs to be taken care of. And in the middle of doing all of that, she looks and sees that Mary, her no good sister, is sitting at the feet of Jesus, just chilling. Now, did you know in biblical terminology, sitting at someone's feet is a sign of discipleship? And discipleship was reserved for men. 
And so Martha looks and sees that Mary is sitting in the seat of a man and neglecting her female duties to help her get the house in order. So Martha looks at Jesus. He says, Lord, don't you care? She shouldn't be sitting there spending time with you. She should be helping me get the house in order. When Jesus hears Martha's concern, listen at how he calls her. Martha, Martha, Jesus calls her name twice. Now, the question you ought to be asking right here, why come? Why come Jesus calls her name twice? Why not just say, Martha, why call her name twice? Now, I suggest to you that part of the answer has to be that Jesus realizes the first call is not enough to grab her attention. That calling her name once is not enough to arrest her attention. So he calls her name twice because he realizes that he has to because Martha will not stop and listen after the first call. The second Martha is the Lord's way of saying, I need your attention. The second Martha is the Lord's way of saying, you didn't hear me when I called you the first time. The second Martha is the Lord saying, I've got to tell you something and I need you to stop and look and listen at what I've got to say. The second Martha is Jesus way of saying, can you hear me now? You didn't hear me the first time. You didn't hear me when I called you initially, but I love you too much not to call you again. So I will shout it out another time because I need your undivided attention. Can you hear me now? Beloved, I came by on this weekend to suggest to you that no matter how holy we think we are, every now and then, all of us need a second Martha. All of us need the Lord to call again. All of us need God to do something that, that garners our attention. That every now and then God has to raise his voice. God has to take us through another experience that is the second call because you didn't hear me when I spoke to you the first time. You didn't get it when I was trying to whisper in your ear. And God loves us too much not to call us again. Have you ever had a second Martha experience where the Lord has had to call you again? Listen, I know some of you are holier than me, so I'm not speaking to you, but I'm testifying on behalf of myself. There have been some moments in my life where God had to yell, some moments when God had to do something to get me to stop, that God had to take me through something to put me on my knees. God has a way of taking you through the second Martha calling. Why? Well, because there are a few things that cause us to struggle in hearing and obeying God. Let, let me share with you the four that have affected Howard John Wesley and you see if any of them resonate with your life. Mark, one of the reasons I've sometimes struggled to hear the word of God, to listen to the voice of God, to surrender to the call of God is arrogance. Let the church say arrogance. Somebody chat that in the line right there. Arrogance. You can literally land in a place where you think you don't need God because you got this all by yourself. The devil has a way of convincing you that you can handle this situation and you don't even need to know what God wants to speak over it, that you got it all in your hands. Beloved, let me teach the Bible for a little bit. God has a will. But God never forces his will on us because of our free will. God desires us to choose his will over all the other alternatives. That, 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 that's why that tree is put in the garden. 
If God wanted to force holiness on Adam, he would have kept the tree out and Adam would have had no other choice. But the tree is there because God wants Adam to choose his will over Adam's own desire. And Adam chooses incorrectly. So the enemy knows that you and I are created with the ability to choose the will of God or choose something else. And so what the enemy wants to do is put you in a place where you don't choose the will of God because you're not even seeking the will of God because you've convinced yourself you can handle this all by yourself. You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to search scripture. You can just do it because you've been doing it all the time. Can I push this? Whatever God creates, the devil deviates. Whatever God purposes, Satan perverts. So watch what will happen. God can gift you with an ability to do something well. And after you've done it well, Satan will come and pervert it and delude you into thinking that your success now means you don't need God. And so the very thing that God purposed to make you successful, the devil now perverts to pull you away from the Lord and convince you that you do it all by yourself. You do it well. When you put your hand on it, it turns out right. You ain't even got to think about it. You're so gifted and so talented and so connected and so smart and so wise and so intelligent that you begin operating out of your own power without even seeking and searching for God. And the very thing God purposed for your success has now been perverted towards your destruction. One of my pastor friends, H.B. Charles, put it like this. Whatever you neglect in prayer, you assume you can handle by yourself. Whatever you don't pray about, you think you can handle by yourself. Whatever you don't take to God, you by default have said, God, I get this all by myself. And I came by to ask you a question. What are you so good at that you don't need God for anymore? What do you do so well that you don't need God to guide and direct you? What are you so strong at you don't need God to help you get through it anymore? What do you do so well that you don't even seek for the will of God over anymore? Y'all, this became so real to me because my oldest son is now driving. He gets behind the car wheel and it frightens me every day. And I never let him go out the house and drive without praying over him. I realize how dangerous driving is. But because I pray over him driving, guess what? Now, when I get behind the wheel, something I do every day, I've learned to pause and pray and realize that too often I've gotten behind the wheel and thought I could handle it all by myself. And I ain't just talking about driving. I'm talking about life. How often have we gotten behind the wheel of our life and just thought we could navigate without God's strength and without God's guidance and without the Holy Spirit because we become arrogant. And arrogance will keep you from discerning the will of God. Beloved, not only has my arrogance interfered with hearing God, but you know what else has interfered with my hearing God? My busyness. Because if the enemy can't convince you that you don't need God through arrogance, he will convince you that there's no time for God through busyness. We live in a world that is over addicted to being busy. We have convinced ourselves that the busier we are, the more important we are. We live in a world that has confused quiet time with wasted time. And rest has become synonymous with lazy. And as a result, we've become so busy that we, like Martha, don't have time to sit at the feet of Jesus. I don't know who this is for, but the Lord put it on me. I want you to understand something, beloved. Every opportunity that comes your way 
is not ordained by God. Every open door is not God's calling to go through it. Every new venture is not God's calling on your life. The enemy knows how to open doors. The enemy knows how to create opportunity. The enemy knows how to hook you up with people who can hook you up. And here's where he becomes deceptive. The doors the enemy opens, the opportunities the enemy creates, the relationships the enemy calls you into are not always evil. Because the enemy doesn't just want to get you into evil. The enemy wants you to get into being busy. Because if I can keep you busy, if I can keep you running around, if I can keep you destroying your health, I can keep you from walking in the peace of God and sitting at the feet of the Lord because you're too busy. So when Jesus sees Martha doing everything, he hollers at her, you're too busy. Somebody right now, that's what God is hollering in your life. You're too busy. If you're not enjoying the gift of family, you're too busy. If you have to multitask your prayer life, you're too busy. If you can't pause and worship for an hour on the weekend, you're too busy. If you're running around and destroying your body and not resting right, you're too busy. If you can go a whole week without opening your Bible and reading words of life, you're too busy. And I came by to ask you a question. Are you too busy for God? What is more important than sitting still with the Lord every day? Arrogance, busyness. Can I give you the third thing that will interfere with hearing God correctly? Desire. Desire. I've said this before, and I want to say it again. It's going to come up on the screen. Leave it up for a minute because I want you all to write it down. The biggest obstacle to discernment is desire. The biggest obstacle to discerning God is your own desire. Let me say it a third time. The biggest obstacle to discernment is desire. Somebody, I know you can't shout amen, but you can wink right here. Just put a little finger up. You can want something or someone so badly that you convince yourself it must be God's will. You, you, you want it badly. You've dreamed about it. You've prayed about it. You and your girlfriend touched and agreed on it. You named it and claimed it. You wrote it on a piece of paper and sent it into the prayer line and you've desired it so long that you can't release it from your heart even when God is trying to share with you that's not his will. Have you ever wanted something so badly that you convinced yourself it has to be God? Beloved, God wants to give us the desires of our heart. He says in Psalm 37, 4, that I will give you the desires of my heart if you delight yourself in me that your deepest desire has to be delighting the Lord by living in God's will. You will never clearly discern the will of God until that is your deepest desire. More than that job, more than that money, more than that man, more than that woman. I want my life to align itself with the will of God. And until that is your deepest desire and your utmost priority, you will always miss God's will by your own desire. So I came by to ask you a question. How deeply do you want to please the Lord? How desperate are you to walk in God's will? How willing are you to say, Lord, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Arrogance, busyness, desire. Let me give you the last thing that will interfere with hearing God. If it's not your arrogance, if it's not your busyness, if it's not your desire, here it is. And Terrence, they're not going to like this word in 2021. Sin, sin, repeated 
disobedience will put you in a place where you can't hear God clearly. Living an unrepentant life will put you in a place where you can't hear God clearly, continuously saying no to what you know God has requested of you and required of you and demands of you will put you in a place where you can't discern the will of God like you want. And here's the challenge. Disobedience in one area can affect your discerning in all areas. Let me say that again. Disobedience in one area will affect your discerning of the will of God in every area. You can't disobey God sexually and think you'll hear him financially. You can't disobey God in, in his call to righteousness and think God will speak to you about what decision you ought to make on your job. When you disobey God and are not repentant, you literally stray away from God. Every time we sin and don't repent, we take, take a step away from God. That's why the word repentance and its real definition means to turn around and come back. Sin is when I stray. Repentance is when I come back. Sin is when I socially distance from God. Repentance is when I return to intimacy with God. When I sin, I walk away and walking away affects my ability to hear God. Okay, someone don't understand me. Um, the other day I had my AirPods in and I was on a phone call and I started walking around and I walked out the house to go take the garbage out and to go get the mail. And I realized that all of a sudden I couldn't hear who I was talking to anymore. And the answer was really simple. I had the ear pods on, but the phone was upstairs and I'd walked away too far from the phone. And because I was too far from the phone, I couldn't hear what the person was saying anymore because in order to hear what they were saying, I've got to be closer to the phone. You can't walk away from the source and think you can still hear the voice. Someone today, could it be your challenge in discerning God that you haven't repented of your sin? So watch this, because of our arrogance, our busyness, our desire, and our sin, we have struggle hearing God. But here's the grace of God, you ready? Here's the amen, here's the shout. God loves you too much just to let you walk away. God loves you too much not to shout his will over your life. God may not force his will on you, but God will put you in a situation where you realize you've got to say yes. G God won't force you, but God will back you into a corner where saying yes to his will is the only thing that makes sense. Br Brooke, here, here's what Jesus says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I won't break in but I'll knock. I'm not gonna sneak in, but I'll knock until you open the door. And if you don't hear the first knock, I'll keep on knocking. And if you don't hear that knock, I'll keep on knocking. Because the Lord knows with the right knock, I can destroy your arrogance. With the right knock, I can interrupt your busyness. With the right knock, I can change the desire of your heart. With the right knock, I can make you get up and decide you need God in your life. The Lord knows how to knock. Can I share with you how God knocks, how God calls, how God gets us to come back? That there are three ways that I want to drop on you and then we'll break till next week. Number one, God's first attempt to get your attention is through the blessing. Let the church say the blessing. God will bless you in a way that causes you to open your eyes to how amazing his grace really is. When God wants your attention, 
When God is calling, when, when God is speaking, God's first attempt is to do for you what you know you could not do for yourself. That the Lord literally wants to bless you in a way that causes you to say, God, whatever you want, I'm willing to do. God will go exceedingly and abundantly above what you ask. God will open a door you didn't even know was in that room. God will grant you favor with folk you thought were strangers. You will pray for one and God will give you seven. You'll ask God to handle a little thing and God will do everything. God knows how to blow your mind. Now I don't know who I'm preaching to right here, but I'm showing sure up preaching to myself. Have you ever had a moment when you were completely overwhelmed by the grace of God? C come on, come on. Don't, don't lie to me here. H have you ever just been doing your thing, meandering through the day, trying to check boxes off, and out of nowhere, you were amazed by how good God has been to you? Have you ever just paused and looked around the circumference of your life and had a, if it had not been for the Lord moment. Have you ever had a God's been good to me moment? Have you ever had a look what the Lord has done in my life? Have you ever been amazed by how good God has been? Every now and then you ought to wake up and tell yourself God's been better to me than I deserve. God's opened up doors that shouldn't have been opened. God has blessed me to live a life I don't deserve to live. God's granted me favor when I should have lost everything. Is there anybody today who's ever been completely amazed by the blessing? And when God blesses you like that, God is whispering in your ear, can you hear me now? Can you see me now? Do you realize how much I love you now? It's the blessing. Oh, but here's the problem. Elliot, here's where it gets a little difficult. Because many of us miss the blessing. And when the blessing doesn't get our attention, God goes to step two. The blocking. Because if the blessing doesn't get your attention, the blocking will. You know what the blocking is? When you look over your life and realize there's some things that could have happened. And if the truth be told, should have happened. But God blocked it. The blocking is when you go through something that should have left you dead or crazy. But God blocked it. The blocking is when you get to the edge and you see yourself headed down the valley of destruction. But God blocked it. The blocking is when you realize you could have lost it all, but God blocked it. You were reckless and stuck on stupid, but God blocked it. The test should have come back positive, but God blocked it. All hell should have broken loose, but God blocked it. Beloved, I'm looking for somebody today who knows a little something like Job did. Bible says that the Satan wanted to put his hand on Job and Satan complained to God and said, the reason I can't get to him is because you built a hedge around him. And I wish there was a sister or a brother today that knows a little something about that hedge of God. If it had not been for the hedge, Satan would have had his way. If it hadn't been for the hand of God, you would have lost everything. If God hadn't held you, Satan would have had his way. Is there anybody watching who's grateful that God blocked it? That blocking opened my eyes to God. Almost losing it all caused me to say yes. I could have been dead. But God spared my life. And there's somebody today watching, you know, you owe your entire life to the hedge of God. If God hadn't stepped in, if God hadn't wrapped you up, if God hadn't released the airbag, if God didn't let the medicine work, if God hadn't held you, you'd be dead right now. 
And if somebody today, you said yes to God, not because of the blessing, but because of the blocking. Elliot, I got to go, but this way it gets a little difficult. It's going to get quiet here. Many of us miss the blessing. And some of us are too stubborn to see the blocking. So when the blessing don't work and the blocking fails, God moves to the breaking. This is the tough one. Because if you don't hear God in the blessing and you miss God in the blocking, then God will take you through the breaking. You don't believe me? Just ask Jacob. He's wrestling with God at Peniel. And while he's struggling with God, the Bible says God breaks his hip. And I've often asked, why does God break Jacob's hip? Because Jacob is fighting too much. And when you fight against God, God knows how to break. Why does God break us? Because he has to. To get us to surrender, many of us have to be broken. The breaking is when the dreams came crashing down around you. The breaking is when you invested everything and got nothing in return. The breaking is when everything you hope for goes in the other direction. The breaking is when the doctor comes back and says, we need to run some more tests. The breaking is when the one who says, I do, changed his mind and said, now I don't. The breaking is when the manager says, we got to let you go. The breaking is when all the money's gone and prayer is all you have left. The breaking is when you hit rock bottom. But here's the grace of God. God will let you hit rock bottom so you find out that God is the rock at the bottom. I don't know who I'm preaching to right here, but God will let you go through the breaking so that you realize that God is all you have and God is all you need. God will break us in order to bless us. Y'all, when I dislocated and fractured my shoulder, I went to see the orthopedic surgeon, a shoulder specialist. And after looking at the x-rays, he said to me, well, we may need to have surgery and it's going to be a complicated surgery. I said to him, what makes the surgery complicated? And this is what he said. He said, the way you're injured in order to heal you, I'm going to have to break the bone and reset it. In order for you to get right, I'm going to have to break it and reset it. You, you miss it. In order to heal you, I've got to break you and reset you in order for you to get right. And that's what I came to tell to someone who's going through that breaking, that God is resetting you, that God is fixing you, that God sometimes has to break us to bless us. But if that is the amen, here's the hallelujah, and I'm gone. Jacob said, the Lord broke me, and I limped after the fight. Okay, pause, you missed it. The Lord broke me, and I limped as I walked away. Okay, third time of charm. The Lord broke me, and I limped, but I still lived. I may have been broken, but I still lived. I may have gone through it, but I still made it. I may have lost everything, but God still let me walk out of that situation. Is there anybody here not ashamed to admit God had to break me? But in the breaking, I got my life together. In the breaking, I said yes to Jesus. In the breaking, I fell down on my knees. In the breaking, I surrendered my heart. In the breaking, I found God. And in that breaking, God is asking the question, can you hear me now? I, I want you to hear me in the blessing. I wish you would catch me in the blocking. But some of you need to go through the breaking. If somebody today right now who's listening, you're in that breaking place. 
And God is asking you, can you hear me now? Can you surrender to me now? Can you realize you can't do this on your own? Will you now slow down? Will you desire nothing more than to be in my will? And will you repent of your sin? My brother, my sister, God is calling you. For someone, God is calling you out of a place of sin through the invitation of grace through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For someone else, God is calling you into this family of faith to be part of something bigger than yourself. And I say to you, whoever you are, as you're listening to the voice of God, there's nothing that stands in the way. There's nothing you've done that God won't forgive. And there's no way you live that won't allow you to be part of this church family. If you're listening today and you're hearing the voice of God calling you to salvation and to relationship with this church family, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go out to our website. You'll see a box that allows you to click. Tell us who you are and we'll reach out to you to share with you how much God loves you and God's plan of salvation for your life. You can send an email to deacons with an S at alfredstreet.org and one of our deacons will reach out to you. We'll pray with you and we'll welcome you into this family of faith. Can you hear me now? As God will give us grace, we're going to come back next week, go into the book of Exodus and look at the call of God upon Moses. Because you know what? Discerning God's will is one thing. Surrendering is another. And next week, we'll continue on in this series. God is trying to tell you something in the sermon. No more excuses. I'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for worship at the Alfred Street Baptist Church. We invite you to subscribe to our social media pages on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook so that you can keep up to date with the latest happenings at Alfred Street. If you join the service late, there's still time to give online or through text to give. And if you feel the spirit calling you to join with this congregation, please send an email to deacons at alfredstreet.org. That's deacons with an S at alfredstreet.org. And now, may the God of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, the God of Isaac and Rebecca, the God of Jacob and Leah and Rachel, direct your steps, make your path straight, Fill your mouths with good things and lead you to that good and promised land. Amen.